so glad you folks have made it back okay two portions of scripture the book of genesis you want to turn there with me genesis chapter uh 16 i think it is genesis 16 and i'm beginning please with uh verse uh five and sari said unto abram my wrong be upon thee I have given my maid into thy bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. Abram said unto Sari, Behold, thy maid is in thine hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. Boy, that sounds like a coward. That sounds like a... Ch- <laughs> Husband doesn't want to get involved. Whatever you want, honey, is fine. Now watch this, and Abram said, well, do whatever pleases you. And when Sari dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. And the angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, I've taught this to you before. He never addressed her as Abraham's wife because she wasn't his wife. Sarah said, you can have her to wife. Heaven didn't recognize that. That was just a one-night shack up. That's all that was. And when the angel comes up, he said, I'm not talking to your Abraham's wife. No, you're Sarah's maid. I don't care what kind of foolishness you guys pulled off. I ain't recognize it. But just stay with me just for a second. Don't get defensive. I got something great to say. Okay, he says, uh, I... She says, uh, Whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sari. Notice she didn't answer the second question. Where are you going, stupid? Oh, I don't know. I'm just running. Oh, so you're taking a trip to nowhere? You don't know where you're going? You're just running? Hmm. Now watch what he said. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, to the lady that's mistreating you, to the home situation that you're not happy with, to the wife that you don't like, or the husband you don't like. Return to thy mistress and submit thyself unto her hands. You must be kidding. You're asking me to go back and be mistreated by this dumb lady that's mistreating me? Yeah. Why? Because you're carrying a future that you don't know anything about. Woo-wee. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for a multitude. And the angel said, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man, his hand shall be against every man, and his man, and every man's hand against him, and he'll dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Okay? And she called the name of the Lord that spake unto him, Lord, thou seest me, for I have also looked on him that looked after me. Uh, One more scripture from the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, I'm sorry to keep you standing so long. Jeremiah 31, verse 1. At the same time, saith the Lord, will I be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus saith the Lord, the people that were left of the sword found grace in the wilderness. I want to teach for a little while. I think 10 or 12 years ago, I preached you a fabulous message on finding grace in the wilderness. I don't think you even remember me ever preaching it, but it was fabulous. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit tonight on finding grace in the most unexpected place. Lord, bless the teaching in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Just to give you a little rehearsal here about grace. Grace is a divine vehicle. It is a channel. It is an instrument that God uses to bring light and revelation 
and instruction to us. If you don't learn anything else, what I'm telling you today, learn this. Contrary to what the nincompoops tell the world today, that grace is given to you to tolerate your junk. Grace is not given to anybody as an act of divine toleration. Grace is given to people to teach them. Grace is an instructor. Grace is an enlightener and illuminator. When you read Titus chapter 2 verses 11 through 14, Now the grace of God that bringeth salvation unto all men has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodly and worldly lusts, we should turn away from stuff. So grace teaches. Now you got to get this. Grace never travels alone. Grace got a traveling partner. Grace always travels with mercy. But mercy don't show up first. Grace shows up first. Because grace teaches and shows us how we can do better. And then when we respond to the grace that's offered, then mercy runs in and fixes it. That's why one of the greatest things God can do for us is to tell us what we're doing wrong and show us what He's provided for us. That's grace. And when we, that's why the Bible said, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, you are saved by grace through faith, that not of yourself. Now that, you need to understand that scripture because that's a, that, that scripture has been totally spiritually molested to think that it says, you're saved by grace through faith. I believe in Jesus. That is not what that scripture is saying. It said, you are saved by grace through faith. What does that mean? Grace tells you what to do and faith complies. Oh. Oh, Biblical New Testament faith is always submission and surrender. So grace tells us what we did wrong. Grace shows us what God has provided for us. And then steps back and says, okay, faith, do your work. And when people respond in faith, before it's ever over, here comes mercy, forgiving. Here comes mercy, restoring. Here comes mercy. Now, i got to go fast because I'm on a time limit. I've already been instructed, do not take a long time. I'm going to try it again. Grace. A friendly disposition from which kindly acts are provided. Showing loving kindness towards. A sense of favor. Bestowed upon guilty people. To be in favor with is to find grace with God. For grace is an overture given to people who are undeserving. Kindness and goodness and gentleness that is given to people who are guilty or out of the way. So that's why the Lord talks to us through Apostle Paul in so many epistles. He said, if you're saved by grace, how do you act so proud and ignorant? How do you act so arrogant towards people? Like, he tells it one time, he says, you people that are boasting with the stuff that you've got, you didn't have it, it was given to you. And if it was given to you, how you acting arrogant like, well, you know who I am. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, we'd all be in hell. It wasn't for the grace of God. We'd be lost forever. The grace of God teaches us. Look, turn to your neighbor and say, grace is supposed to teach me. Ready? Mercy is supposed to show me compassion. I, I, I shared with Brother Alex the other night something I've taught for 40 years in the Pentecostal realm. And I, and I really think that uh, the Pentecostal people don't understand much about grace and mercy. Let me help you with it. Grace gives you what you don't deserve, an opportunity. Mercy holds back what you do deserve, judgment and wrath. So, so grace comes and says, you're wrong, but God wants to make you right, and here's what you need to do. And when you and I respond to that, then mercy says, forgiven, restored, reconciled, fixed. So look at your neighbor and say, grace is a teacher. I wonder if I'm listening. It's not demanding, it's just teaching. 
grace teaches us that we have to deny some things, we have to alter some things, we have to adjust some things. That's what grace does. My uh, personal, I don't want to say anguish, uh, disgust, that's a nice gentle word. My disgust with the, com the common teaching of grace is simply that, no, if you're under grace, then God tolerates all your ungodly, horror, stupid junk. Oh, no, it doesn't. Grace is not a license for disgrace. Grace is an educator, a vehicle, a channel, an instrument that teaches us what to do. When, when you and I fail and we fall, wish I could get a witness here. Mercy picks us back up. Watch. And then grace teaches us how not to do that again. So that's why nobody can make it to the city without grace and mercy. I wish I had a witness here. We are debtors to grace. We are debtors to mercy. We, could, we couldn't even come before the throne of grace except grace is teaching us. Come on, you're welcome. You're welcome. Come to that you might receive help in the time of need. So, so grace is trying to teach us that we're mistaken. And then mercy is trying to fix our mess. And then grace is trying to say, now don't do that again. Now I don't know about you, but I've had grace teach me lots of times, don't do that again. And I said, no, nah, I think I'll do it. And then once I do it and I fall in the same mud hole, I'm looking for mercy. Say, where are you, mercy? Oh, well, I travel with grace. Didn't you listen to what they told you? I know I'm talking. I'd like to talk for a few hours. I don't get to talk much. I'd like to talk. Grace. Let me go a little further. Grace. Undeserved favor, kindness, or goodness. God's grace is especially shown as he shows mercy and deliverance from the people's enemies or evil or Satan. Grace is a sovereign act. Listen carefully. When God shows grace, it doesn't happen because of any exterior anything that's outside of himself. Nothing that people do, anything they say, can cause grace. He gives birth to grace out of his own divine nature and out of his goodness. He just says, I'm going to show grace to you. If you're here tonight and you're saved, you ought to have a 30-second praise break to think that grace brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And when... Uh, woo! Grace, grace teaches us some things. Grace is, grace is a wonderful thing. But like I say, grace is not a license for disgrace. I have talked to so many people over the years that talk to me like I'm in bondage, I'm in legalism, uh, I, I'm a Pentecostal Pharisee because I believe that God requires some things. Oh no, I, I've had people say, oh no, I'm, I'm under grace. I said, let me help you with this fool. From Genesis 3 on, the whole world has been under grace. Adam and Eve were under grace. Israel was brought out of bondage under grace. Israel received the law of God under grace. A greater fullness and demonstration of grace came when Jesus Christ showed up. Grace has gave birth to the church. Grace has helped the church. Is there anybody besides me that ever had a wrong attitude, said something wrong, did something wrong, and this little voice got in you and turned around and said, you know, you're better than that. That's the grace of God teaching you, saying, come on, you, you know better than that. Have you ever felt pricked or prodded in your heart that I need to repent or I need to go apologize to somebody or uh, I wish I could get... If you don't say amen... Give me a Baptist cough here, a Methodist nod. Just, okay? You, you, you get this feeling like, I didn't handle that very good. You listen, when you and I do stupid stuff, or mainly I do stupid stuff, you do almost stupid stuff. When I do stupid stuff, there's this voice, this urging, this twinging something in me that, 
that says you didn't handle that very good and and you didn't show a good spirit about that now i didn't conjure that up i'm not going to indict myself i'm not going to punch myself in the face when that voice and that urging and that sensation comes that is the grace of god trying to teach us come on you represent me you're better than that you're the body of christ you're a child of god you're filled with the holy ghost you're baptized in my name the blood is on you the name is on you the spirit is in you well let me see i, I can't see very good so uh, I guess there was about five of you had your hand up. The rest of you don't believe a word I just said. You, you don't ever have God just slap you around like that? You're probably not walking with God because only people who walk with God get slapped around. I wish I had time. I'd like to really go crazy right now. In fact, I think I'll just mess up my sermon for a second. Let me ask you. Are you a follower or do you walk with him? They're not the same. You see, when we first get to dealing with the Lord, the Lord does the first initial thing. I want you to follow me. The problem in the Pentecostal movement is we've got too many people that have stayed in the mode of following. Following is supposed to lead to walking with. See, you and I can follow afar off, but you can't walk with him afar off. You can follow him and never hear his voice, but you can't walk. Ah, you can't walk with him and not hear his voice. You can follow and not feel his presence, but you cannot walk with him and miss his presence. I, I, I don't know about you, but I've been asking God day in and day out, Lord, I, I do want to follow you. But I, I, I also want to walk with you. I, I, there's a big difference. Because one, one can be at length and one is close proximity. How many times have I told this wonderful church where I've challenged you and asked you, are you walking with God or do you just walk with somebody that walks with God? Lot, Lot didn't walk with God. Lot walked with Abraham. Abraham walked with God. Gehazi didn't walk with God. He walked with Elisha. Elisha walked with God. Demas didn't walk with God. Demas walked with Paul. Paul walked with God. It is possible that you and I can be a believer, but really we're just a follower. We're not walk. We're not walking with him. Remember the story that I, I've preached to you many times from Genesis 5 and Hebrews 11. Where it talks about an, an Enoch walked with God and he was not. For God took him, but before his translation, he had this testimony. He pleased God. Can't nobody, preacher, anybody, music director, Sunday school, nobody can please God that just follows him. I, I preached a great message years ago. I know it. It's in my brain. said, in order to experience removal, you've got to experience approval. And you can't have approval when you're just following. Remember the story with Peter? The Bible said he followed him afar off when they arrested Jesus. That's the danger of following afar off. Because after a while, you're going to get put into a situation and you're going to lie your way out of it. He started cursing and damning and condemning. I don't know that guy. I never met him in my life. No, I never know nothing. But one look from the Lord. Now watch. <laughs> See, you and I can walk. You'd be surprised what kind of stupid stuff we'll do when we walk long distance. If you read John chapter 6, the Bible said that he turned around and told those people, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Watch. Then many of those disciples that heard this, here it is, walk no more with him. Why? Because in order to walk with him, there are certain disciplines and consecrations and dedications that have to take hold of us if we are going to walk with him. 
Uh, I can't see because I've got these lights on, so I'm just assuming that you like me. Fine. I'm going to give you a little quote from the prophet Amos. How can two walk together except they be agreed? You don't have to agree with Jesus to follow him. But you're going to have to agree with him to walk with him. I'm going to go a little further. I'm not, I'm not doing any injustice to the word of the Lord when it says except to be agreed, how can they walk with each other? I'm going to add my interpretation to what he's saying. Because if you're not careful, you'll think that the only way you can walk with God is to see eye to eye. That ain't so. Here's how two can walk together if they get agreed. One submits to the other. And I got news for you, baby. He ain't submitting to us. He, he ain't going to try to please us. He's not going to try to fit in with us. He said, you want to walk with me? You need to surrender. You need to submit. You need to alter your attitude. You need to change your actions. Because everything I do is right. Am, am I doing good yet? I, I thought I was doing good. I just, I'm just not used to talking here okay so I'm, I, I gave you a pretty good interpretation of what grace is grace is a scene in God's deliverance that he puts on people and tries to deliver them from things by teaching them what to do but mercy is an outward expression or manifestation of compassion and pity for the ills of others mercy means to feel and exhibit compassion towards Causing one to be spared, forgiven, delivered, or helped. You got me? So grace teaches us. It, it shows us what's wrong. In other words, grace shows up. The, the thing I'm trying to share with you t tonight is the unexpected, astounding place that grace shows up. Of all places, a wilderness. Now, you know, I, I could say, yeah, grace will show up in a church house because you got all those church junkies there. But what happens if you're in a bunch of hellacious wilderness? And the choir's not there and you don't have any Jeff Arnold tapes? What are you going to do when you're in your... Uh, you're not hearing me. Let, let, let me... <laughs> Let me go a little further. Wilderness, an uninhabited place, a place that is desolate or desert place, deserted, lonely. Say what you want to, but we like Israel. I was going to have him read those scriptures in Deuteronomy. I'm just going to run by things. Watch. The Bible told Israel, he said, I found you in the wilderness in a howling wilderness you were in the wilderness of slavery you were in the wilderness of messed up religion you were in a wilderness and my grace came and found you in your wilderness instructed you to slay the lamb put the blood over the door stay inside and wait while the death angel passes by so they were saved by grace through faith you got me so so grace Grace shows up in the wilderness. Now, when I read that scripture for you with Hagar, and I've taught you a lot of things on Abraham and Sarah and Hagar, but Hagar, I've always felt so sorry for Hagar because Hagar kind of got used and abused. She kind of got snow jobs. She was a slave. They brought her out of Egypt, and, and she didn't have any rights, and Sarah couldn't seem to come up with any children, so they made this little deal, and I'll have a, 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 a baby by proxy. You can't have a baby by proxy. You have a baby by prostitution. You don't have a baby by proxy. And, and she ends up and says, hey, you can have her, and she can be your wife, and heaven didn't recognize it. I told you that. So he turns around and has an affair with Hagar. She conceives and gets pregnant. She puts her eyes on Sarah. Hello, barren lady, you old stupid jerk. Well, Sarah didn't like it one bit and starts an argument with her old man and says, you need to get rid of that old bag. Well, you're, you're the one who told me to take the old bag in bed. Yeah, but I, 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 I've changed since then. Watch what she says. My error be upon you. <laughs> 
Why should my error be upon you? You're the one that came up with the plan. Yeah, but the plan backfired and I'm ticked. Now, Abraham, if you read the rest of that scripture, Abraham is grieved. He's, he's really grieved over what's happened here. And the Lord has to get involved with him and saying, don't be grieved over it. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But first lesson, Hagar runs away. And she's running for her life. She doesn't know where she's going. She's just tired of being abused. Well, please hear me. I'm trying to help somebody. You may be like Hagar right now. Not, not uh, with an um, illegitimate child. Not with an immoral episode. But you could be moving right now wounded in your wilderness. You could have been mistreated by somebody. And that becomes a wilderness. Now, those of you that are acting like you're really saved and spiritual, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to people who are honest enough to say, man, I've had to deal with a wilderness a lot of times. I, 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 I've made a lot of mistakes. I've, I've had people hurt me. I've had per people offend me. I've had, uh, I've had people disappoint me. Listen, baby, when you get in the wilderness, you don't know where you're going. You don't know how to get out because there's no, as our sweet pastor has been teaching, there ain't no signs in the wilderness. There's nothing that says five miles, Stuckies. There's, there's nothing, two miles, Paisanos, cold iced tea. Not in the wilderness. And, and so she stops at a well in the wilderness. Now watch. Hey, this is what blows my mind. In the midst of her woundedness and her hurts, and her inability to get things turned around, God sends an angel to her. Because they find grace in the wilderness. Woo! I don't know how many times in my life God has sent an angel, a mercy, a song, a sermon, a thought, a feeling, an encouraging word that somehow came to me in my wilderness and seemed to say, you can make it. You're going to come out of this. God's got a plan for you. God's got a purpose for you. You're not going to die in your wilderness. You're going to find grace in it. So the angel shows up and says, where are you going? What are you doing? He says, I run from, my, from uh, Sarah. She's being mean and ugly to me. And she turns around and says, get back there and submit yourself to her and put up with it. Why? Because your future is more important than your hurt feelings. And if you don't get back into the negative situation that you don't like, you will not give birth to your tomorrow. Now, you don't think going back didn't take some grace? I heard Paul write in the New Testament when the Lord talked to him to try to take that sickness away or whatever it was three times. And he said, my grace is sufficient for me, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. I, I, I'm not trying to change the word of the Lord. I'm just trying to expound on it. And my strength is made perfect in your wilderness. Because when you're in the wilderness, you're as weak as water. When you're in the wilderness, you're in a place full of death. You're in the wilderness, all you got is voices and echoes and owls and serpents and all kinds of crazy stuff. And you got scorpions all over the place. Man, you, there's no encouragement, there's no tape decks, there's no choirs, there's no sermons. Watch, when you're in the wilderness, you are alone with your thoughts. You watch out because your thoughts can produce feelings and feelings can produce actions and actions can produce death. Destinies. You need to be careful when you're in the wilderness, lest your wilderness gives birth to a wrong decision. Because one of the voices that you hear when you're in the wilderness is, you're going to die here. God doesn't care about you. You messed up and you deserve this. The devil is a liar. I don't care how many times you've messed up. You don't deserve this or deserve that. There are consequences to making mistakes. Am I doing good yet? I'm going to get to Genesis 21. 21, I'll get there in just a second. Okay, now, so Hagar gets an angel to come to her in her wilderness. Look at your neighbor and say, in the wilderness. 
grace showed up. Now, if God's no respecter of persons, you ought to be pregnant with expectation that when you're going through your next wilderness, look for a divine visitor. Whether you see the angel with your physical eyes, there could be a sense, a feeling, an encouragement, a song, a scripture, a thought. God could bring back to your memory when you had a victory over something that was similar to this. I'm, t I'm talking good. I know I am. I know I am. I'm talking good, man. Wow. God delights. He delights in showing grace and mercy to people. But He loves to do it when you're in the wilderness. Why? Because when He gives grace in the wilderness, you can't be dumb enough to stop and get your picture taken. So that when you come out of that, you start telling people how you did it. I'll tell you what, if you have been in a real wilderness and you came out of it, here's what you're going to be singing. If it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, if it had not been for God who is rich in mercy, if it had not been for God who found me in my lower state, if it had not been for the Lord when I was feeling stupid and acting stupid and doing stupid, I know I, I use this term a lot, and I hope, I, I guess, I don't know, I hope it doesn't offend you. Maybe it does. I, no, I, I haven't heard. But uh, I use this term all the time. I'm not a virgin voice up here. And if that offends you, I'm sorry, but I'm not a virgin voice up here. I uh, resigned from this church, and, and I want to help some of you. You didn't fire me. You did not throw me out. You did not vote me out. I took the future of this church to heart. And I wanted to make sure that before I got sick or messed up, this church will be put in good hands and we've got somebody that's taking care of this church. But I didn't get fired. I stepped down. Now, that's just me talking. That ain't the Holy Ghost. I'm talking. And I said all that to say this. And since I stepped down for one year, I have been wandering in the wilderness. Groping. Wondering. I have no second thoughts about resigning. Resigning was correct. Bringing this man in was absolutely correct. But me, what am I supposed to do? Where am I supposed to go? I, I know I'm an old buzzard, but I can still preach like a house of fire. And I, 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 I'm not intimidated by nobody. And I just, I just feel like I still got some spizzerankum in me, and I'm still supposed to be doing something. And while I can travel and go all over the nation, that's fine. But after 35 or 36 years of pouring my life into here, I want to bless this church. I want to be a, an assistance to this church. I don't want to be a liability. I want to be an asset to this church. And I'm just in a wilderness trying to find my way through this. And, and I, can't, I can't say... Enough good about Brother Tony. He's been so gracious and kind and generous and warm to me. But it's like uh, we had a talk the other day. And maybe he's watching me on the movies tonight. Fine. said, uh, we had a talk and I said, what am I supposed to be doing here? He said, well, you're the bishop. I said, what does that mean in English? You ready for his answer? I don't know. I said, well, that's great. That makes two of us. I don't know either. So he was so kind. He said, well, uh, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know. <laughs> so, so I'm lost in the wilderness, and he's trying to pull me out of the wilderness. And, and it's like I'm going, I don't know. Uh, it's just like. Wow. 
Uh, can I just say this? Yes, I can. I got the mic. I can say that. You are not a second-rate spiritual idiot because you're in a wilderness. Anybody in this Bible that ever did anything good for God had to go through wilderness experiences. Even the Lord Jesus Christ had to deal with the wilderness. You ready for this? But in the wilderness, angels came and ministered unto him. And if angels did it for him, angels will do it for us. And I just, I'm just wondering, and I hope I didn't offend anybody, but what I just said is just that I'm just groping. I'm trying to find out what to do. He, uh, Brother Tony, he's, he's such a sweet man. He made a sweet statement. He said, you know, Bishop, this is kind of awkward for me. He may be watching the movie right now. Uh, he said, uh, I have never pastored a church that had a bishop in it. I said, don't feel bad. I've never been in a church where I was the bishop. I'll know. I'll know. I'm just, I'm walking through this thing, but I know one thing. I'm not in it alone. And I know that I'm pregnant with the future. And I know there's something in God's divine purpose for me to accomplish. And sooner or later, God is going to help me to realize it and find it and be able to move in it and walk in it and be a blessing. You know, just because I retired, I didn't stop loving you. Let me tell you something else. All you folks in this church that I know where all the dirty laundry is. I know where everything is. You ready? I want you to breathe a sigh of relief. You're safe with me. It'll never be shared with anybody. It'll never be talked to about anybody. I put it under the blood. I prayed for you a hundred different times. It's okay. Sometimes, sometimes people that you do the most for are more afraid of you than anybody. People that you've lent money to or given money to despise you after a while. People that you've helped them and you've covered their sins under the blood and, and they had their little promiscuous foolishness and they did some stupid stuff. They're always looking over their shoulder like somehow you're going to expose them. Baby, let me help you. I got apostolic amnesia. I ain't worried about nothing that's happened before and I'm not holding anybody hostage about anything. I got too many skeletons in my closet to be digging up your skeletons and putting them out. But I know one thing, God is rich in mercy and God is the God of all grace. And I am a debtor to grace and I'm a debtor to mercy. And I owe so much to God, I ain't got time to point fingers at anybody. Well, that was for free. I'm getting the description just a minute, Rev. So Hagar has is, is been found by an angel at a fountain. And the angel tells her to go back. Because grace will always locate you. Here's what, here's what I'm excited about. It's in my notes. Here's what I'm excited about. The Lord, I was praying and God gave this to me. He just gave, I, wrote, I stopped and I wrote it right down. He said, tell my people, no matter how terrible and wicked their circumstances are, I can find them. No matter how bad their personal condition is, it will not thwart my grace from showing up where they are just like they are to help them change. Now grace expects us to change. And mercy helps us change. Is this it? Watch this. I got one more, and then I'm going to finish, okay? I'm trying to... I bring you a drawing. Come on, read, read for me, Rev. For 21, 14. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread 
and a bottle of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it now, on. Now wait a minute. Let, let me let me let me let me Brooklynize this statement just now. And Abraham took the girl that he took to bed and had a baby by and threw her out. Now Sarah wanted her out of there. Abraham, the Bible said, is grieved because he loves the boy. You understand the boy? The boy's almost 13 years old. He's not two. You're not getting it yet. You need to turn your internet off for a few minutes and read your Bible. He was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. He was 99 to 100 when Isaac came. So he had 13 years of silence. Read it. When he had his affair with Hagar, I mean with, with uh, uh, Hagar, and they gave birth to Ishmael, God stopped talking. Read it. 13 years. He never talked to her one time. He said, oh, well, if you could run this by yourself, I'll shut my mouth. Go ahead. Thirteen years later, when he's 99, now God visits him again and says, you ready to do the promise? So, that, so, that, so that, that kid's at least 13 years old. And you know when anybody turns 13, excuse me, they're rotten. They're in development of evil, can evil. They're starting to be. When a lot of our kids turn 13 and 14, that's when our moms lovingly say, get out. And so that kid's 13, 14 years old when she says, get rid of that guy because he was mocking at the child. And Sarah got ticked off because he was mocking. And Abraham didn't want to do it. And the Lord said, hearken unto your wife and go ahead and do it. Now that liked to kill him because he loved that boy. His, his whole future was tied up in that boy. He thought that boy was going to be the prophetic promise. I said, oh, that Ishmael would live forever. The Lord said, well, uh, you, you, I, wish you, I wish I had time. you got to understand something. He said, I'm going to bless Ishmael because he's your seed. Watch this. But my covenant is not with Ishmael. Please hear me, you church people. Hear me. Don't get frustrated when people in false doctrine build bigger churches than you have. God will bless people who he's not in covenant with. He said, I'm going to bless Ishmael for your sake. He's going to become a great nation, going to have 12 princes. Fine, going to be a wild man. But I'm not in covenant with him. My covenant is with Isaac. You got to hear me. We are like Isaac, the children of promise. The people that are baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they are in covenant with God. Oh, God. So he turns around and he says, throw her out. He puts a bag of a thing on her shoulder. Says, goodbye, honey. Goodbye, Ishmael. Hope you make it in the wilderness. Don't you know his heart was broken? Like any mom or dad who send their kids off somewhere, aren't their hearts broken? Now, now watch this. Read for me, Rev. Uh, wait, are you bored? No. I, I'm, I can't get used to the silence here. Are you bored? They don't usually have these lights on for me, so I'm blind completely. I can see Daniel, just about Daniel. He doesn't have his wallet out. I know that. Okay. Are you ready? Re read for me, Rev. And the water was spent in the bottom, and she cast the child on the one of the shrubs. She cast the child under the shrubs. And she went and sat her down ag over against him a good way off. Yeah. As it were a bow shot. A bow shot. For she said, away. let me not see the death of the child. Right. In other words, go ahead. And she sat over against him and lifted up her voice now and watch wept. watch what's going on in the wilderness there's crying and there's dying and here comes grace mm. <laughs> yeah. let me try it again crying dying here comes grace mm. I didn't say worthy and deserving I said crying and dying and here comes grace 
Because grace doesn't happen because of anything outside of God's nature. He just sovereignly graces people. He just graces whom he will grace. And so he looks at this woman who's crying and the child who is crying and dying and says, I got to help this situation. You see, here's what you got to understand. The verses before that I read when the angel met her at the well, he gave her a prophetic promise. Here's the dirty trick with the wilderness. I've been there enough. I got a season's pass in wilderness. I know what I'm talking about. When you get in the wilderness, you forget the promises. See, when you got the promise, ooh, 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 I feel so good. Ooh, 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 ooh. But all of a sudden you get in the wilderness and you can't even remember the promise anymore. The angel said, I'm going to make a great nation out of him. I'm going to bless him. You're going to have all this going on. But now she's in the wilderness. And because the wilderness is a lonely place and it's an evil place and it's filled with death, that wilderness has a way of talking to you. Well, the promise is going to fail. The promise is not going to work. You're going to die in the wilderness. And if you're not careful... You're not careful. The wilderness will drive you crazy. The wilderness, if you stay in the wilderness long enough spiritually, you want to quit church. You'll stop praying. You won't study your Bible. You don't ever fast. I wish I had a witness now. Because one of the gifts that wilderness will give you is total despair and discouragement. Because when you're in the wilderness, you can't just look up Strong's Exhaustive Concordance and get an answer. You're in the wilderness. Now, now I, I, I was going to ask you to read that again because I think you overlooked something. But just go back and read it one more time, if you would. And uh, she went and sat her, sat her down over against him a good way off, as it were a bow shot. For she said, let... No, 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 no. You, you missed it. Verse 14. Try it again. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and yes. took bread... And a and bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away. Now watch this. Here and it is. she departed and wandered in the wilderness. Stop. That's the wickedness of the wilderness. You find yourself wandering. No purpose, no direction, no divine illumination, no understanding of the things of God. You're just wandering. Brother Tony, I don't know whether you're watching. I hope you're not mad at me. I, you've been so kind to me. I'm the guy that's wandering. I'm trying to find my way. I'm going to find it after a while. God's going to help me to know it. I'll find it. But at the present time, Brother Frank, it's not fun. The sand is hot and the air is dry. And there ain't much water. Ready for this? And when you're in the wilderness, Daniel, there's no fellowship. All those stupid people that leave stay out of church all the time. They're dumb as a dead frog. When you abandon and abort fellowship with the people of God, you're shooting yourself with spiritual suicide. I'd rather keep coming to a church with people that have problems than stay home and watch TV or play on the internet or do some other stupid something. Amen. Sometimes I come to this service and I'll walk around and shake hands and, and Melanie's always got, she's just a sweetie pie. She's just got a million dollar smile. But there's, there's a half a dozen people in this church that I make sure I see them because nine out of ten times they go, and there's 20 or 30 that I try not to shake hands with because it's the joy of the Lord that keeps them going. It's like I just go, look out, Jack, there's some kind of disease I'll hold to you, pal. I do that all the time with you, Joni. I know I kid and I laugh and I go, okay, you the lady with the dollar kisses, here we go. She just smiles and laughs. I said, well, that's crazy. That's okay. When you are in the wilderness as many times as I am, I need a little friendship. I need a little laughter. I need a little enjoyment. I need a little people to just have a little camaraderie with. Just, I don't like just shaking hands with Pentecostal salmon. I don't like that. I just... 
Now, so, all you folks that sit in those cheap seats over here, never get over here, you need to give yourself a treat once in a while, even next Sunday. Get over out of here and go over and walk over to JC. You see, look at him. He's right now. The man's crazy. The man's absolutely good. All he ever does is just like him. You go, see, they, the, you, you go to preach and say, God is good. You go, you go to talk to him like that. He'll hug you and talk and tell him. He, he said, that's right. You're on it, brother. Go. And I get a bigger, I just walk away and go, I may be in the wilderness, but I'm coming out. Wow. Oh, yeah. Sometimes you just need a good word. Sometimes you need just a good hug. Sometimes just a kind look in your face can help you go through the wilderness. I'm almost done. And the Bible said she wandered in the wilderness. Read for me, Rev. And she sat over against them and lift up her voice. She threw the kid under the bushes. I don't want to see him die. Fine. She lifted her voice and wailed. Go ahead. And God heard the voice of the lad. Yeah. And, and the uh, angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven. Now wait a minute. He said, now watch this. And the angel of the Lord said, what aileth thee, Hagar? Now if I would have been Hagar, I'd say, you've got to be kidding, right? Have you not studied the situation? I've been thrown out of the tent. I had this baby illegitimately. They dumped me out for pr producing a service. Now I'm out here in the wilderness. I'm sunburned. I ain't got no water. My kid's dying. And you ask me what's wrong? Well, you laugh all you want to, but I wonder how many of us besides me that God sometimes through His Spirit has said to you, What's wrong? Why are you so upset? Why are you mad? Why are you depressed? Why are you discouraged? Am I not rich in mercy? Have I not told you I'll never leave you? I'll never forsake you? I'll never put on you more than you can bear? Are my promises void just because you're wandering in your wilderness? done. I'm almost done. I, I'm sorry. Uh, I was supposed to finish in 30 minutes. Go ahead. Uh, re read for me. And said, the angel said, what aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Watch this. Now watch this so powerful. Arise, lift up the lad. Wait a minute. Stop. I wish I had time. I'd like to preach this. It's time in your wilderness to pick up your dream that you laid down. The lad was her dream. In the wilderness, he's become her nightmare. And God says, I'll tell you what, when I visit you by grace in your wilderness, I'm going to tell you to pick up your joy, pick up your faith, pick up your dream, lift up your hopes. Woo! Sometimes you don't even know you've laid it down until God talks to you in the wilderness. He said, lift up the lad. Read. And hold him and in hold thine hand, for I will make him a great right. nation. Now he's rehearsing and renewing the promise that was made way back at the well. And I will bless him, and I will anoint him, and I will use him. Sometimes in the wilderness, one of the blessings is God gets to refresh us and rehearse to us the promise he's already told to us that we somehow have forgotten. Because one of the ministries of wilderness is amnesia. Read. And God opened her eyes. Wait a minute. Here's the next thing that happens. And she when, when grace shows up, grace will show you stuff that's there that you didn't know was there. Here's why, Aunt Carol. Here's why. Because when you get in the wilderness... Your hurt feelings, your upset, your frustrations, your financial problems, whatever the situation is, it has a way of blinding the best of us. Because God didn't just make that pool of water, Frank, right there. That water was there, but she was full of grief and resentment and anger and bitterness. And I'm telling you, when you get in a wilderness and you let those kind of feelings and thoughts work in your life, it can blind the best of us to what God has in store for us. Now, I think, as Brother Tony would say, I think that was a good place to give a good amen right then. You missed a good chance to say something. 
Well, I, I feel like I'm talking to a bunch of people up here that you... Are you having trouble with the word wilderness? You don't know what it means? You, you, holy roller people, you've never had to deal with the wilderness? Unanswered questions? Unfulfilled prom promises? Divine dimensions of God? That you were expecting God to do this and do that, and instead God put you in the wilderness? Don't you get it? One of the blessings of the wilderness is we're, we're, we're funneled down to one hope. If he doesn't help me, I'm dead. If he doesn't come to my rescue, I'm dead. If he doesn't show up in my wilderness, I'm not smart enough to survive my wilderness. Are you ready to go home? You ready? You ready? You he, said, he said, lift up the lad. I'll finish it. Lift up the lad. Fine. Lift up the lad. And she, she opened, he opened her eyes and she saw the water. She drank. The boy drank. And the future was guaranteed. Watch. And she came out of the wilderness. I got, I got one more little story to, to if I can. You see my sign? I didn't write this sign for you. I wrote it for me. Watch. Bible said, you, at this church knows, outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, my favorite guy in the whole Bible is Elijah. I love Elijah. Fireball prophet. I love Elijah. We know the story. He calls fire down. He outruns the chariot 19.2 miles through the valley of Jezreel. Shows up. That old bag sends him a letter. About this time tomorrow, the gods do to me and more so if I do not make your life like one of them. Daniel, that, I shouldn't use the word broad. I won't say that. That, that woman is as safe as can be. She is saying Elijah's demise is depending on the gods that don't exist. Said the gods do to me. What gods? Not the ones that didn't answer on Carmel. Not the ones that couldn't call fire down. What gods are you talking about? So she's safe. She says, the gods do to me. You lying dog. There ain't no gods. You're safe as can be. You ain't going to get hurt by these gods that can't do nothing. I make your life like one of them about tomorrow. We know the story. He got filled with fear and got filled with panic, and he ran. This is what I'm trying to, I've spent 40 minutes trying to get to my message. And the Bible said when he saw that, he ran for his life. The scripture says he went a day's journey into the wilderness. Uh-oh, here we go again with the wilderness. And he goes under this little juniper tree, and he, and he says, Lord, let me die. Watch out. You get, in a, you get in the wilderness deep enough and long enough, you'll think you want to die. You want to give away your future. Because you can't see anything but the wilderness and the threats behind you. Wait a minute. And when you get in the wilderness, the wilderness will magnify our failures a million times over. So he's under the tree, right? Under that bush. Bible said, and he's under a juniper tree. Behold, an angel of the Lord came and touched him. Well, wait a minute. They found grace in the wilderness because your situation and your conditions and your circumstance don't stop him. And your personal spiritual condition, good or bad, doesn't stop him. And that angel found him there, exhausted, under the tree. He's filled with panic. This is a guy that just killed 850 prophets. This is a guy that shut a nation down for three and a half years. This is a guy that called fire down and called rain down. That outrun a chair. This is a guy who the Bible says the righteous are bold as a lion. He stood in front of that whole nation and said, I'm not afraid of one of you bums. And this silly lady writes him a note and says, I'm afraid of you. Why? Because the best of us will have our moments when we panic. The best of us will have our great faith crumble on us. Boy, it got quiet. 
How could this happen to this guy? He stood against Ahab, stood against 800 false, 850 false prophets. God protected him at Zarephath, protected him at Cherith, protected him at the widow's house. How could a note from this old bag drive him out of town? It's real easy. I'll tell you why. When you have been in a spiritual exercise for a long time, and he had just confronted all these prophets, and then had the miraculous and the supernatural happen, then he was anointed and ran 19.2 miles. You must understand, there's no indication that God ever told him to go to the Valley of Jezreel. It's the only time in his life that it's ever showed that he did something under his own direction. You say, well, the Bible said the hand of the Lord was upon him. Yeah, but it didn't tell him to run. It just inspired him and equipped him and excited him. And that's another danger. Sometimes when you get anointed of God, if you're not careful and you don't wait for the purpose of God to be revealed, you can accidentally and unknowingly do something stupid. You ain't. I don't care. I see Sister Treadway. She's writing the notes that look fine. Look all you want to. God did not tell him to run to Jezreel. Told him to go to Cherith. Told him to go to Zarephath. Told him to go to that widow's house. Told him to go show himself to Ahab. Told him to do the thing on Carmel. I've done all these things at thy word. Told him that the rain was coming. The rain came. Never told him to go to Jezreel. He was just enthused, excited, and ran. And he became susceptible to a situation and she run him out of town. And he's in panic. Can't hardly believe it. It's like Superman lost his cape. They stuck kryptonite in his socks. He's in trouble. He's, he's running for his life into the wilderness. Going as far into the wilderness as he could get so they wouldn't catch him. Because in a moment, if God doesn't hold us, our best faith can give way to our worst fears. We know the story. He's under the juniper tree and the angel come and I, I like that, Bruce, because apparently the angel watched over him. No critters ate him during the night. The angel just showed up. It's like God said, uh, hey, I've been watching my boy, Lige. He's, he's really discouraged right now. W would you go take care of him? Now, I don't know about you, but the little bit that I've studied about angels, angels are such supernatural, high, holy beings. They're not given to making breakfast. They take care of God's throne. They run God's universe. They do divine battles against spirits, wickedness in high places. They don't bring people an egg McMuffin and a cup of coffee. And watch this. This is so, to me, this is so cool. You ready? Mel, give me your smile. Are you ready? This is so cool. God says, yeah, but I know Elijah's failed me right now. And I know he's discouraged and he's disobeyed me. But I love him so much and he's done so much for me. I'm going to show him some special service. I'm going to, I'm going to send him a male waiter. And, and, and he taps him and wakes him up and says, hey, get up, eat and drink. It always blows my mind, JC. It blows my mind. When he looks up the angel, it's like, no big deal. Now, to me, I find myself in Elijah. Here's why, Joni. You ready? I'm telling you. Here's why. He ate that meal, never said thank you. He said, I deserve this. Really? Never said thank you. Never said praise the Lord. Never said nothing. He just gulped it down. Went back to sleep. Angels stayed around, waited. Hey, stupid, get up. Eat and drink. For the journey is too great for thee. Watch, in the wilderness, you can get divine direction. God knew where he planned to go. I'm, I'm trying to finish. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm so late. Watch this. Elijah is dejected. Ready, Vince? But not rejected. He has failed, but he's not forsaken. 
He's done something awful. He went AWOL. But he's not abandoned. That's us. Even in our worst moments, even in our darkest wildernesses, God will not turn his back on us when we make some bad decisions. I'll, I will take my usual five minutes. Five minutes. You ready? He goes to, to Horeb. He goes into the cave. You know the story? Do you really know the story? I wonder if you really do. You know the story? Elijah, what doest thou here? Now you understand, when God asks you a question, it ain't because he don't know. He asked him a question. He said, what doest thou here? What he was saying was, you're not fulfilling my purpose being here. Why are you here? Why are you here? Why did you abandon your post? Well, uh, they've killed your prophets and they've slain them all and they've pulled your altars down and, and nobody's living for you. I even only I am left and they're trying to kill me. I get a kick at it. They are trying to kill me. One dumb lady. See, that's what happens when you get into the wilderness. It multiplies. They are trying to kill me. He says, really? You know the story. He puts on a show. He turns around and he says, Elijah, second time. What doest thou here? Oh, I've been very jealous for the Lord. And they've killed your prophets. And they pulled down your altars. And they're not obeying you. And they're not listening. And I even I only am left. Now, I'd just like to say this while I'm leaving. Now, you can disagree with me, but I am totally right anyway. Obadiah put a badge on himself because he had kept those prophets in the cave. All those hundreds and hundreds of prophets and said, Was it not told Elijah, my master, what I did when Jezebel killed all the prophets? How I took them by hundreds and I fed them with bread and water in there? Let me help you with this. A prophet that doesn't prophesy is useless. As far as Elijah was concerned, all those morons weren't worth talking to. Because a hundred hiding prophets are worthless. Not as bad as a hundred Pentecostals that keep their mouth shut. That never witness and never testify. said, I even only I am left. Okay, I'm finished. You've been very kind and sorry I've kept you so long. Here's what I wanted to bring up for you. He's dejected, not rejected. He's failed, he's not forsaken. Okay? He's AWOL, he's not abandoned. Here's what I love. In all that dissertation between God and him, God never brought up his failure. He was too busy blaming himself. This man is overwhelmed with guilt and disgrace. And God, in his wilderness, Frank, gives him fresh grace. What does he do? He said, I'm going to let you hear my voice all again. He hadn't heard it for a while. Now I'm going to send you and send you back to work. Watch this. And he never brought up his past. And when David made his mistakes with Bathsheba, God never brought up his past. And when Jonah got swallowed by the whale and the Lord delivered him, God never one time mentioned to him his backsliding and his disobedience. He said the word of the Lord came to him a second time saying, you ready to do my work? See, God will not bring up your past. He lets his people do that. You can stay in. You see my sign? See my sign? Here's what it says. This way out. Lord, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the wonderful people. Thank you for the honor and the privilege to try and share some things about 
they found grace in the wilderness. Lord, I thank you for grace in my wilderness. I thank you for how many times you have brought grace to my life in my darkest hour, my loneliest time. Even now as I'm wandering, trying to find my direction and which way to go. And I know you're going to help me, but I thank you. That surely as you showed up for Hagar and you showed up for Elijah, you're going to show up for me and for this church. Bless us and keep us safe. Bless Brother Tony, the rest of his preaching. Bring him home safe and sound. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Shake hands, be friendly, go with God. It's over. I'm done.